Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, an analysis of the Hindu newspaper from UPSC perspective. Today we will be discussing the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 18th February 2020. And the articles that we will discuss today are displayed on your screen. So let us start the discussion. Now this article on page number 11 has been written in the context of the anniversary of the Pulwama attack where a number of CRPF personnel died. So in this regard, this article highlights the various issues with the Central Armed Police Forces and also provides certain suggestions for improving the condition of the Central Armed Police Forces. So in this article, we will try and understand what is the role of the Central Armed Police Forces or the CAPFs. Secondly, we will look at these important issues and concerns that are being faced by the Central Armed Police Forces. And ultimately, we will look at some of the suggestions which have been provided by this article for improvement in the functioning of the Central Armed Police Forces. Now, what is the role of Central Armed Police Forces and what are these forces? Now, under the Constitution of India, the police and public order are state subjects. That is, they are mentioned in the state list under the 7th schedule of Indian Constitution. However, the Ministry of Home Affairs assists the state governments by providing them support of the Central Armed Police Forces. So which all police forces have been defined as the Central Armed Police Forces and what is their role? So first is the Central Reserve Police Force or the CRPF and it assists in the internal security and the counter insurgency operations. Second is the Central Industrial Security Force and it protects vital installations in India like the airports and the public sector undertakings. Then there are the National Security Guards which are special counter-terrorism force. And then there are four border guarding forces which are the Border Security Forces or the BSF, the Indo-Tibetan Border Police or the ITBP and then there is Sashastra Seema Bal or the SSB and then there is Assam Rifle. And all these forces guard the borders of India. So these are the Central Armed Police Forces which deal with the security structure. Now these Central Armed Police Forces have been facing various problems and issues in their functioning. And some of these include chaotic deployment, unregulated expansion of these forces. Then there are infrastructural deficiencies. There are shortages of transport and arms and ammunition. There is poor personnel management. And also there is ineffective coordination between the state police and the central armed police forces. Also there is lack of in-house grievance redress mechanism and various other issues are there which are hampering the better or proper functioning of these central armed police forces. And due to this, most of these forces are witnessing lot of casualties in the field level. For example, lot of personnel of the central reserve police forces have died in the Pulwama attack. And also, many of them have died in the Maoist insurgency areas. Now again, due to the improper working conditions, lot of personnel of these Central Armed Police Forces are seeking premature voluntary retirement. So in this regard, let us look at some of the issues which are faced by the Central Armed Police Forces in India. Now various security forces are important for us from the General Studies Paper 3 point of view under the topic Security. And this has been provided under the subtopics, various security forces, agencies and their mandate. Further, this article highlights that the Home Minister of India has recently stated that the CRPF Jawans would get to spend 100 days with their families. However, this seems impossible as of now. So in this background, let us look at the various issues which are faced by the Central Armed Police Forces. Now, the first and the foremost issue or the concern regarding the functioning of the CAPFs is the vacancy in these organizations. So, according to the data of the government, there is almost 15% vacancy in the Central Armed Police Forces and approximately 1.5 lakh posts are lying vacant. Another concern which has been highlighted by various committees and commissions and also reports of Home Ministry is the deployment of Central Armed Police Forces in the states. Now we know that the constitutional mandate is that the public order lies within the state list. However, the central government has been deploying under the Home Ministry the Central Armed Police Forces in the states. And in this case, there has been heavy dependence by the states on the Central Armed Police Forces even for the day-to-day -day law and order issues. Now what this deployment does is that it affects the anti-insurgency and the border guarding operations of these forces like the CRPF and the BSF etc. And it also curtails the time for training of the personnel of these central armed police forces. 
Further continuous deployment of these central armed police forces reduces the morale of the forces because they get very less time for rest and recuperation. Now third important issue which affects the central armed police forces is the poor allocation for capacity augmentation of these forces. And most of the expenditure which has been done based on the budget which is allocated to the CAPFs is spent on the salaries of the personnel of the CAPFs. However, the fiscal performance in case of outlays which are allocated for the capacity augmentation of these forces or the personnel of these forces has been very poor. And this has been highlighted by various reports of the parliament. Another important and the grave concern is regarding the working conditions of the personnel of the Central Armed Police Forces. And according to a report of the Home Ministry of India, personnel under these forces work for more than 16 to 18 hours per day and they get very less time for rest or sleep. Further, many of the personnel of these forces are not satisfied with the medical facilities that have been provided to the personnel at the border locations. Now, another concern is that the personnel or the members of these forces are not treated at par with the armed forces in terms of the pay and the allowances that are provided to the armed forces. Further, the demand by these forces for having a similar pay structure to that of the military services has not been agreed to by the 7th Central Pay Commission. And this has reduced the morale of the personnel who are working or deployed under these Central Armed Police Forces. Now again, a kind of allowance is provided to the personnel in the Border Guarding Forces who are posted in the hard or tough terrains. However, this allowance which is provided to the personnel of Central Armed Police Forces is much lower as compared to the members of Armed Forces. So these points highlight that the working conditions of the Central Armed Police Forces is way lower as compared to the armed forces in India. Now as we have seen that the personnel of these Central Armed Police Forces are facing poor working conditions. Now another concern has been related to the promotion and the service conditions of the personnel of the Central Armed Police Forces. Now various officers in these forces have been approaching the higher courts over the issues of stagnation discrimination and deprivation of the financial and the promotional benefits. Now in the top positions in the Central Armed Police Forces, various IPS cadre officers are deployed on deputation. However, the promotional benefits at the highest level of the organizations are reserved for the personnel of the IPS cadre which are deployed in the Central Armed Police Forces. And this has been provided even when the majority of IPS cadre officers do not have any field experience that of Central Armed Police Forces. Further, there is an acute stagnation in the cadre of Group A officers or the highest level officers of the CAPFs. And this affects the morale and the efficiency of the existing officers in the services. Now, another important concern is that as the top positions in the hierarchy are filled by the deputed IPS officers, this adversely impacts the progression of the career of the officers which have been directly appointed to the Central Armed Police Forces. And this has been one of the important concerns which has been raised by various personnel across the Central Armed Police Forces. So as we have seen, various issues include the vacancy in the Central Armed Police Forces, further the deployment of these forces in the day-to-day -day law and order situation in various states, then there is poor allocation for the capacity augmentation of these forces and as such these have been witnessing large-scale casualties in the Maoist insurgency areas etc. Then there is poor working condition and poor promotion and service conditions for the personnel of Central Armed Police Forces and this is adversely impacting the morale of the personnel of these forces. So after this let us look at the suggestions which have been provided by the author in this article for improving the working condition of the personnel of Central Armed Police Forces. Now the author in this article suggests doing away with the exclusivity of the Central Armed Police Forces. Now we note that various Central Armed Police Forces have specific functions or mandate that has been provided to them. However, the author in this regard suggests that it should be compulsory for the recruits of all Central Police Forces to be deployed to anti-insurgency roles during their first 15 years of service. So this means that not necessarily the CRPFs will be deployed in the anti-insurgency roles, but also the Central Industrial Security Force, 
and other agencies or other forces should also be deployed for initial 15 years of services. And this will improve the efficiency of working of the personnel because they are newly trained and are fit for fighting in the initial years of their service. Now after the initial 15 years of service, these personnel can then be shifted for the next 10 years to the border duties. And the last phase of the career of the personnel of the Central Armed Police Forces should be in static duties. And by doing this, the present system of a soldier ending up performing a high risk job till the last day of the service will be done away with. Another important point that has been raised by the author is the rehabilitation of the retired personnel in this regard. And this can improve the morale of the soldiers. Now already a concern is that a large number of personnel are taking voluntary retirement or premature retirement. However, there is no rehabilitation policy for such personnel. Now in this regard, the Welfare and Rehabilitation Board has been created by the central government. However, this is not having any major impact on the rehabilitation of the voluntary retired personnel. Now besides these suggestions, as we note that the number of vacancies in the Central Armed Police Forces is large. So one of the suggestions could be filling up of these vacancies so that the burden of working does not fall on the existing cadre of these services. Secondly, the deployment of the Central Armed Police Forces in the state should be a measure of last resort. And also there should be more allocation of budget for the capacity augmentation of the personnel of these police forces. Further, the working condition of the personnel of these police forces needs to be improved and harsh working conditions like working for 16 to 18 hours a day should be done away with. Also, the pay and perks should be similar to that of the armed forces. Further, the promotions and the career progression of the personnel of the Central Armed Police Forces should be similar to that of the IPS cadre officers which are deployed on deputation in these services. So these are a few suggestions that can be added to the issues that have been highlighted regarding the functioning of the Central Armed Police Forces. So in this background, you can try and answer this question from your mains examination perspective under the paper 3 of the general studies. And you can use the points that we have mentioned during the discussion of this article. With this, let's take up the next news article now. Now, this article on page number 9 talks about the decline in the bird population in India. And this has been highlighted by the State of India's Birds Report 2020. So, this will be important for us under the preliminary examination syllabus, under the topics, general issues on environment and ecology, biodiversity, etc. So in this article, let us try and understand about the state of India's birds report and which all organizations are collaborating for bringing out this report. Secondly, we will look at the key highlights of this report and some of the important species that have been mentioned under this report. And in the end, we will look at the eBird platform, which is an internet platform which has been provided to the bird watchers in India. So this report, which is the State of India's Birds Report 2020, has been published in partnership with various organizations. And these include the ATRI, the Bombay Natural History Society or the BNHS, Foundation for Ecological Security, National Biodiversity Authority of India, the Salim Ali Center for Ornithology and Natural History, Wetland International, World Wildlife Fund, etc. And you might be knowing that a question was asked in the preliminary examination of 2014, which was related to the Bombay Natural History Society. So in this line, it is important to know the organizations which have collaborated for bringing out this report. Now, this report has been brought out after an assessment of long term trend, the current trend, distribution range size and the overall conservation status of 867 Indian bird species. And the report is based on more than 10 million observations which have been contributed by more than 15,000 bird watchers to the eBird platform. And this is also being claimed as one of the first comprehensive assessment of birds in India. And that is why the highlights and the observations of this report become important for us from the exam point of view. Now regarding the observations of this report, 55% of the Indian bird species have seen population decrease over the past decades. However, 126 species have shown stable or increasing trends over the last 25 plus years. Further, various species which were considered to be under threat 
and those species which live close to the people or the habitats such as the house sparrow and the indian pea fowl are doing well according to this report now another important observation has been that some globally near threatened species which include the black headed ibis the oriental darter have stable or increasing populations and therefore they are classified as low conservation concerns for india so the names of these species that is the black headed ibis and the oriental darter which have a globally near threatened status and are having low conservation concern in india are important for us from the exam point of view further there are certain species which are endemic to the western ghats in the peninsular india and these species have shown considerable decline and these include the raptors migratory shorebirds etc further other important common species like the small minivet the common green shank and the oriental skylark have also declined and further birds which eat invertebrates have declined as a group according to the observations of this report further the report highlights highest declines in the past 25 plus years for certain species and these include the white rumped vulture the richard spit indian vulture etc and the names of all these species have been provided in the pdf attached to this video now some of the causes of loss of bird biodiversity in india which have been highlighted by this report includes the habitat loss and the fragmentation of the habitat of the birds secondly the birds are indicator species of the state of our natural world however they have been affected by poaching changes in food change and introduction of invasive species further the introduction of chemicals and toxics such as the diclofenac in case of vultures is another important concern regarding the decrease in the bird biodiversity in india so in this regard some of the suggestions which have been provided by this report is that the red list of the endangered species which is published by the iucn should be updated for indian birds further there is a need for collaborative research between the scientists and the citizens and it should be aided by policy with special emphasis on removing the gaps in data regarding the bird biodiversity in india now lastly we all know that the report is based on more than 10 million observations which have been contributed by more than 15000 bird watchers to the e bird platform now this e bird platform is a citizen science initiative so let us understand that this e bird platform is managed by the bird count india in partnership with large number of organizations and the groups which are working to increase our understanding of the distribution abundance and population trends of the indian birds and the data on the portal is submitted by people across india who are mainly bird watchers and even the observations of this report are based on the observations of keen bird lovers so these are few important observations of the state of india's birds report 2020 with this let's take up the next news article now now this article on page number 15 highlights that the response to the long term repo has been encouraging and this has been highlighted by the reserve bank of india now we know that the indian economy is facing economic slowdown presently and in this line the rbi has been reducing the repo rate in order to inject more amount of liquidity into the economy however this reduction in the repo rate has not resulted into improved economic condition of the indian economy so to take this forward during the recent monetary policy committee meeting the rbi has decided to further inject around rupees 1 lakh crore into the banking system and it aims at doing so by the long term repo operation or the ltros of 1 year and 3 years so in this regard it is important for us to know as to what is the repo rate what are overnight repos and also what is the long term repo operation and finally what are the likely impacts of such long term repo operations and how these long term repo operations are different from the routine repo operations undertaken by the reserve bank of india and this can be important for us from the preliminary examination syllabus point of view under the topic economic development now repo rates are generally the rate at which the banks borrow mainly short term loans from the reserve bank of india and under this mechanism the banks sell their government securities to the reserve bank of india and this is done based on an agreement to repurchase these government securities at a future date at a fixed price now the rate at which the banks repurchase these government securities from the reserve bank of india is known as the repo rate normally 
Now, depending upon the majority periods of these loans, there are different types of repos in India. The first one are the overnight repos, which have a majority period of one day. And then there are term repos and there are different types of term repos depending upon the maturity periods. For example, there are term repos based on 7 day maturity period, 14 day, 21 day, 28 day and 56 day maturity period. Now these overnight repos are available to the banks from the Reserve Bank of India from Monday to Friday every week. However, the term repos are available to the banks only when the Reserve Bank of India notifies about these term repos. Now one important thing about these term repos is that the interest rate on these term repos is determined through the auctions and accordingly the interest rate on these term repos is usually higher than the repo rate which is announced by the Reserve Bank of India. And we note that the Reserve Bank of India announces this repo rate for the overnight repos or the interest rate on the overnight repos. So the main difference between the overnight repos and the term repos is that in case of term repos, the interest rate is determined based on auction. And as the interest rate is determined based on auctions, the interest rate is usually higher than the overnight repos. Now in this background, the Reserve Bank of India has introduced a new policy tool and that is known as the long term repo operations or the LTRO. So what was the need of carrying out the long term repo operations? Now we note that the Reserve Bank of India has been continuously decreasing the repo rates to inject liquidity into the economy. However, the banks have not reduced the rate of interest on the loans commensurately due to poor monetary policy transmission, which is a result of various other economic factors. Further, another concern was that the rate of interest on the long term loans has remained much higher and has hindered the investment rates within India. So in this line, the Reserve Bank of India has carried out the long term repo operations for reducing the rate of interest on long term loans, incentivizing the banks to reduce their overall lending rates and improving the monetary policy transmission. So how is the RBI carrying out this new monetary policy tool in terms of the long term repo operations? So this long term repo operations or the LTRO is considered to be similar to the term repos as we have learned here. However, these term repos under the LTROs have a longer maturity period of one year and three years. Now, how these long term repo operations are different from that of other term repos that we have learned. So it should be noted that the interest rate on these LTROs is not decided based on the auction and they are decided based on the fixed repo rate, which is announced by the RBI for the overnight repos. And as such, the interest rate on these LTROs is fixed at the interest rate for the repo rate. And thus the interest rate on the LTROs is lower as compared to other long term loans which are provided by the Reserve Bank of India. And thus it is likely to inject long term liquidity into the economy at a lower interest rate. So how is this LTO going to take place? So the total funds that are to be injected by the LTRO operations are up to rupees 1 lakh crore. This has been decided by the Reserve Bank of India and the interest rate for these LTROs will not be decided based on auctions and they have been fixed at the repo rate which is announced by the Reserve Bank of India. Again, the LTROs would be carried out through e -Kubair. Now this e is a core banking solution of the Reserve Bank of India, which enables each bank to connect their single current account across the country. And this e is also used by the Reserve Bank of India to execute various transactions with banks such as carrying out overnight and term repos and also reverse repos. So this term e becomes important for us from the preliminary examination point of view. And you might be knowing that in the year 2016, UPSC has already asked a question related to the core banking solutions. So these are a few highlights about the new monetary policy tool which is being used by the RBI which is the long term repo operations and this is being done in order to inject liquidity into the Indian economy to improve the economic growth in India. So this can be important for us from the preliminary examination point of view. With this let's take up the next news article now. Now this article on page number one is related to the judgment of the Supreme Court which says that the women army officers are now eligible for permanent commission. Now, this is an important judgment of the Supreme Court because it breaks down the stereotypes towards women. 
and now women army officers will also be considered at par with the male army officers so this can be an important part from general studies paper 2 under the topic social justice and social issues so to understand the current judgment of the supreme court let us understand the current status of women in the army so presently the permanent commission is currently granted to only two services namely the judge advocate general's branch and the army education corps however in february last year the permanent commission was extended to other non combat services which included the regiment of artillery corps of engineers corps of signals etc now normally we note that in army there are combat roles and support roles which are known as the non combat services and in those non combat services the permanent commissioning of women was allowed by the government of india in february last year however this was done only prospectively to officers who have joined the short service commission after the march 2019 and in this line this supreme court judgment has directed the government to extend the permanent commission status to non combat services retrospectively to women officers who have joined before even 2019 and currently the women who are serving in various non combat services in the indian army are entitled only to the short service commissions now one of the drawback of this is that women can serve only for 5 years which can be maximum extended up to 14 years now what this does is that this deprives them of the pension and retirement benefits which require a minimum of 20 years in service and accordingly this provision of permanent commissioning will have to be provided to women in the indian army based on the supreme court judgment so presently the women have a role in only non combat services in the indian army and due to this they can work for maximum 5 years which can be extended up to 14 years and this deprives them of the permanent commissioning benefits so recently the government of india had extended the permanent commissioning for the various non combat services to the women also however they had done this prospectively for those who will be joining the army after march 2019 however the supreme court has said that the government will now have to extend this permanent commission status to all the non combat services retrospectively to women officers who have joined before 2019 also now what is the present status of women in the indian army so indian army still does not provide for combat role for women and combat roles include their role in army infantry armored corps mechanized infantry etc however the indian air force has allowed women in the combat role since 2019 and in navy the women naval officers already perform the combat tasks so these are few highlights of the judgment of the supreme court regarding the permanent commissioning of the women in the non combat services in indian army now after today's discussion let us take up these practice questions from our preliminary examination point of view and the answer for these questions will be displayed after 5 seconds so the first question reads consider the following statements about the long term repo operations of the reserve bank of india first is that the interest rate for the long term repo operations is being decided based on auctioning which is incorrect statement because the rate of interest on these long term repo operations has been fixed at the repo rate second is that the maturity period of ltro is 1 year and 3 year which is correct so the correct answer is b that is true only next question reads state of india's birds report 2020 has been published by which of the following So as we note that the report has been published by the collaboration of 10 partner organizations and as such it has not been released by any one organization thus the correct answer here is d that is none of the above so with this we conclude today's discussion now let's take up the question for today 